Hey there, folks. This is Kevin Madison from Project Dragonfly. I hope you enjoy this podcast about Dragonfly community members doing inspiring work. If you have ideas for a guest or want to be more involved in this podcast, please feel free to directly email me. Thanks again for listening and enjoy the episode. This week, I spoke with Angie Trumbull. Angie is the Conservation Education Specialist at International Bird Rescue. She has done work looking at oil spills and other wildlife emergencies, as well as being involved in literacy campaigns with Dawn Dish Soap. And Angie was in the Global Field Program. She's just about graduated and has traveled throughout Central and South America and also worked in China. Angie and her husband live in Salt Lake City where they enjoy birding and welcoming foster and guest dogs to their home, which they now call the Hound Hotel. So I hope you enjoy this discussion with Angie. Okay, Angie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. (laughs) So uh, yeah, I thought you could just start with telling folks um, a little bit about who you are and what kind of work you do, where you live, all of that. Sure. So my name is Angie Trumbo, and I currently work as the conservation and education specialist for International Bird Rescue. Uh, They're based in California with centers in Northern California and Southern California, but I actually work remotely from Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, So I just kind of coordinate a lot of their education efforts, the community engagement, and some of their conservation efforts as well. Awesome. Yeah. Remote work. That's super cool. You can be in Salt Lake City and working for an organization in California. Um, So how long have you been working there? I've been working there since 2017. Um, I actually started as a volunteer at their LA center. I used to live out in the Los Angeles area and started volunteering in 2016, but then got hired on um, in their administrative staff in 2017 and have been just working in a number of different roles since then. Nice. Cool. Um, well, we'll come back to your work with uh, that organization. It sounds sounds amazing. Um, but I wanted to also just give folks an idea of your dragonfly journey thus far. So you're in the global field program. Mm-hmm. And what what has that been like for you? Where have you gone? What have the trips been like? No, it's been sure. an amazing experience. Um, my background prior to this is actually in international business. Um, So I kind of developed a bug for travel uh, during those studies, and um, I was really excited to see the opportunities through the Global Field Program to get to travel and learn about things that are more in line with my passion, which is um, avian conservation. Um, So for my first year, I went to Baja on um, the the Earth Expedition out there to study uh, research methods, and we stayed at the Vermilion Sea Institute and Rancho San Gregorio out in kind of the middle of Baja, California, which was absolutely spectacular. It was um, an experience that I couldn't have even imagined how beautiful it would be there. And um, really exciting to see the different partners. Uh, The Vermilion Sea Institute folks were um, really great to work with and took us on some great adventures, learning about whale sharks and monitoring their populations there and uh, researching uh, fish and different different things all around the area there. And then we got to go out to the desert and learn about kind of the conservation efforts and um, kind of sustainable farming and things that they have going on in the the area at the rancho there. So so I've, I've instructed that course, I think about six times now. Right. So I've, I know the area well. And as, as a fellow bird nerd, um, I've spent a lot of time on that deck there at the Institute of Vermilion Scene Field Station, um, trying to tell the difference between like Herman's gulls. I think there's a few different gull species there. And and as someone who's not from the West Coast, I'm always like, <laughs> can I tell these apart? And are they a year one gull or a year two gull? And yeah. Um, but anyway, everyone else is like, why look at the gulls? We have like <laughs> all these other things happening, like sea turtles and such. Um, yeah, it was very cool. Did- yeah, we could see the blue-footed boobies diving yep. for fish while we're trying to focus on lectures and things. But as a birder, <laughs> it's always hard to like focus when there's there's birds around. <laughs> yeah, there's there's so many of the Earth Expeditions classes that are like the the classroom, quote unquote, is like the most beautiful spot you can imagine for learning. Um, I think actually with the AIP as well, the zoo based um, and botanical garden based programs, there are some of those classrooms that are usually like 
in an exhibit at a zoo with glass that looks out mm-hmm. on something. And it's like, it's just such a unique way to learn, but it does come with that negative of distraction. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. Where, where else did you go? Um, the next one I went on was the Amazon trip um, out into the Peruvian Amazon. And that one was like peak bird distraction area because yes. um, we studied at, um, oh, what is the name of the place? Casa Tamando was the building where we we're studying, but it's, um, oh, Seacot uh, with the. Yes. The there. The um, center and- for, it, it's in Spanish, of course, but it's, yeah, like Center for Environmental and conservation or community conservation or something but yeah um and we had um ursula valdez was our our instructor there and she's an avid birder and so it was just um birder's paradise for sure and it was a lot of fun because a lot of the folks in the class weren't really into birds and kind of new to that and just were interested more in just going to the amazon and learning about things there but they got to explore and kind of see what um what an amazing experience it is to go out into the um, the rainforest and just see literally hundreds of species of birds while you're there. It's um, that was probably the most spectacular um, from like a wildlife perspective. The things we did on that trip, we um, we went to a parrot play lick one morning to observe thousands of parents parrots as they they flew in to hang on the cliffs and look um, the the rocks along the river and um, yeah, just the place where we stayed where it's it was right on the edge kind of in between primary and secondary forests. So we got to actually go out into the the rainforest with um, guide led, guides took us on walks through there to see the different plants and animals, insects and night hikes as well. Uh, so it was just really, really spectacular. Nice. Yes, I am a fan of night hikes always and night snorkels as well, um, which is, a, it always has that feeling of like a little bit scary, a little like yeah. <laughs> takes me back to being a kid some sort of summer camp vibes or like you're going into this trail and um or like even almost like like a halloween kind of moment but <laughs> but with biology wonders yeah. around every corner um, and it can be a little spooky the sounds of the <laughs> the monkeys and different birds and things it's it's quite a different experience we we came across a bushmaster in the path um yeah on one year I was down there and on that Amazon course and it was very intimidating. I mean, that is one of the heaviest um, venomous snakes in the world. Um, And so just seeing it sort of coiled up um, sort of a massive of snake coiled up like the stereotypical image you think of, and it, and it would not move off the path, even though we sort of made some noise and such. And so we ended up bushwhacking around it. So 20 humans bushwhacking around this single snake such was our kind of respect for its what it what it can do um definitely in charge of that situation (laughs) yes yes but um but yeah wonderful course focused on avian ecology like you said with with uh ursula and the rest of the team down there very cool Nice. And, and did you, have you been on your third earth expedition? Yes, too? My, my last one was to Costa Rica. So we had Hayes Cummings was our right. instructor for that one. And we had a wonderful in-country guide, uh, Marco, who they call Marcopedia because he has facts <laughs> about everything, whether it's the history or uh, the plant life, animals, everything there. Uh, so he was a really great guide on that, on that expedition as well. So what I've heard about that course, I've never been on it, is um, it's just wonderful for having delicious coffee in the morning while looking at hummingbirds. Absolutely. Yes, we spent (laughs) several days at the Cloud Forest Reserve there, and there is a wonderful cafe with hummingbird feeders all around it and just a great place to hang out. And I think what was really interesting about that trip, especially with it being my third one, where we started in Baja and the Amazon, where the accommodations are a little more rustic. I guess you're sleeping under the mm-hmm. stars or you're in little lodges, but staying at that cloud forest reserve where we had showers and <laughs> screened yeah. in windows and everything, it was a very different experience with the the food there was fantastic. And um, we had more than we could possibly want to eat of everything. It was delicious, but a different experience after kind of roughing it a couple years and then were, were you kind of disappointed? Here, were you like, this is, this is too, don't spoil me now. Yeah, it was, it was hard, you know, a little bit of both there, a little disappointment because <laughs> it is fun to take those challenges, um, especially mm. for me, because I haven't been 
before this trip, I had never really gone camping under the stars or done anything like that before. So that was always a big kind of stepping outside of my comfort zone thing to go stay in these different places and bathe in the ocean instead of having um, regular showers and things like that. And it's kind of fun to to stretch and do something different that way. But also nice sure. to have a hot shower at the end of the day. So <laughs> can't really complain either way. Totally. Yeah. So I've, I went to India this uh, last year and I'll teach that course again um, this summer. And I will say that course in terms of outside of comfort zone, what it is, is just the mainly, and I think some of the courses that have base, you have to go through cities in East Asia or Asia um, where the cities are so congested and so intense. Um, for many of us, I'm a New Yorker and I still, you know, was kind of overwhelmed by Delhi um, of course, we just kind of move through Delhi. We're not really in Delhi very long, but yeah, each course can have its challenges. And especially like you're saying for yourself, having never really camped, um, but what an eye-opening experience, you know, to lay in those cots in Baja and look up at the stars and see the constellations and swim with whale sharks, all these things that I think many people never realized they'll even, they didn't even know this was an option. They didn't even know about these things. Well, and I feel like it's very empowering too. like having maybe been a little nervous about that at the start. Now I feel like I can do so many things that I hadn't really imagined before and um, just open to more opportunities after experiencing that. Yeah. Salt Lake City, you're near, you know, whitewater rafting and all sorts of great, uh, not too far from um, Wyoming and from um, Yellowstone and such. So um, anyway, you got lots mm -hmm. of adventures definitely, I'm sure it's definitely need to start doing some of those things we just moved back here a couple of years ago and um, need to maybe get some supplies and try out some camping and things on our own um it'll be a new so experience you, without guides <laughs> to do, help do, us do, do you have a family or um I'm married uh mm -hmm. so my husband and I live out here and then my parents and my brothers live out in uh, the Salt Lake area as well cool yeah I ask because so I you know, I have uh, wife and kids and um, I find that going on these earth expeditions, I often come back and I'm sort of motivated to try and emulate some of the experiences I've had. Of course, like, you know, it's not like we're going to all pack up and fly to, you know, the Amazon. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we definitely want to do some of those trips, but a lot of times it's more just a mentality and a philosophy of how we even live in our home place. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, like how we approach life on a daily basis or on the weekends um, and just trying to do things that are a little more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So wh where are you from originally? I'm from Salt Lake. Um, okay. I grew up out here just kind of north of, north of Salt Lake City. Uh, but after I graduated college, I moved out to California because I wanted a change of scenery and um, mm -hmm. just kind of to try something new and make it in a new place. So I lived out in LA uh, for about eight years or so. And that's where I met my husband and um, kind of where I transitioned and started the dragon. So I started dragonfly program in LA and then moved halfway through it. So that was an interesting experience and community and uh, a lot of the coursework that we're doing because I had to have a brand new community for the second half. <laughs> right. Program. And, and that's very common because I think a lot of people join this program and you know, probably our median age in this program, well, there's a range obviously, but anywhere like 25 to 35 or so um, is probably the middle percentile bands. And like, um, you know, that is a time where people are often having that big transition of moving. Um, so when every single course is asking you to connect with your community and you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> this is going to be tough. Um so yeah, so let's switch gears a little bit into your like your um community your your challenges, um community leadership. Um what have you done for that and how have you segued between those locations? Sure, for my community leadership program or challenge, I did a I created a conservation action program for International Bird Rescue where I work. And this kind of ties to talking about like changing communities and having different areas where you're based um, because they have their two wildlife centers in Northern and Southern California. Um, a lot of our volunteers are just centrally located around those two regions, but International Bird Rescue, as the name kind of suggests, where we have a really broad 
impact. We respond to um, wildlife emergencies all over the world and um, try to communicate and teach others about birds everywhere. Uh, so this program I came up with was designed to help engage folks uh, who love birds, care about birds, and want to be a part of our work, but may be located all over the place or may not have the ability to come into the clinic for eight hours a week. Um, we just wanted to um, encourage people to take action to protect birds and their habitats wherever they are. So kind of creating that um, connection to place and community that has been a big part of the Dragonfly program for me. Um, I wanted to inspire others to kind of take those same actions to look around them, see the birds that are around them and see what kind of impact they can have in um, kind of their immediate location. Uh, so the conservation action program is designed so people can sign up as volunteers, get a volunteer shirt, and then find events going on in their community, whether that's like trash cleanups, uh, restoration events, bio blitzes, all sorts of things that kind of have that conservation angle towards them. Um, and then they can participate in those events, but be a voice for birds while they're there. Some of them might be tree planting where people are thinking about, you know, trees and neighborhood and shade, but um, they could use somebody there to kind of point out there's benefits for the birds here as well and uh, helping others around them start to see uh, the birds that share our, our habitats and our environments in our cities. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I saw the some of your write-up of the Community Leadership Challenge and you had like a metric about how many birds, you know, benefited from these actions of these volunteers mm -hmm. you had, you know, how many volunteers joined this program um, and then you had like, it said like 463 birds benefited or something like that, which I thought was a cool way to quantify and assess a program. And I think a lot of people are always like kind of not sure exactly how to share that. So how did you come to that? And what was your thought process on assessing this program? Yeah, well, the thoughts were first, uh, the first metric was just people involved. So people who signed up for the program um, and people, it also has a corporate element where businesses can work with us to have all their employees get together and do a large group event. Uh, so I started tracking how many people we were engaged with to do these actions. Um, and then what each person does after they complete a project or something that they uh, take part in, there's a form that they can fill out that says what they did, where they did it. And, you know, how many people were involved. And then um, we also encourage everyone to keep an eye out for birds while they're working on these different projects. And so they can report how many birds they saw and what types. Because uh, the way we think about it is, um, you know, if you go to a beach cleanup and you're cleaning up discarded fishing line or, uh, you know, any kind of trash or things like that, that's um, fishing line that cannot entangle any of the birds in that area anymore if it's removed from that space. So every bird that you're seeing there, you've protected them from that risk of um, ingesting foreign objects or any of those types of, of threats that birds face. So um, that's just kind of our way of tallying, like we've made that stretch of beach safer for that many birds that we saw that day. And it's just a small fraction of the reality of that situation. Like sure. birds we saw there, there's birds in and out all day, every day, but it at least helps us kind of get a feel for um, the impact we're having and feel good about what we're what we're doing and the birds that that we're helping. Awesome. I love that. That's that's such a clever way, I think. I mean, as as you said, I mean, it's it's just a sort of a, a, a estimate of what the benefit is, but it's a cool way of thinking like, oh, if they're in this habitat, yes, it is. And then we're picking up trash. We're removing this from the system. So that's that's uh, that's great. I love that. Um, you also mentioned with International Bird Rescue you know, that they, the organization responds to global emergencies. So I'm just curious, like, do you have some examples of some of the things that the organization as a whole has done over the last um, few years that you've been involved with? Yeah, since I've been involved, at least some of our international responses that, um, not necessarily that I've been on, but that I've uh, been with the organization. Um, in 2019, we went to South Africa, there was, um, drought conditions and some water management issues that caused a um, lake to dry up and a whole nesting colony of lesser flamingos abandoned their chicks because there weren't enough resources uh, for them to feed them. So they just abandoned them to move elsewhere. And so our group came in uh, along with a few other local groups, there's sand cob in the area that collected all those orphaned flamingo chicks and um, we helped hand raise them. 
uh, to hopefully, you know, rescue that generation that otherwise would have been lost. Uh, so that's one of the recent ones. We also responded to an oil spill off of the coast of Lima, Peru. Uh, that was, I think, in 2021. I can't remember the year exactly, but that was our most recent international spill that we were a part of. Um, but throughout our history, we've responded in New Zealand, off the Galapagos, Japan, France. We've been all over the world uh, with these oil spills. Um, but what we're finding um, nowadays, because regulations have gotten better, um, people are generally doing better as far as preventing massive oil spills like we used to have through the, the 80s and 90s. Uh, but there's in the um, kind of this changing world with climate change and everything going on, there's different challenges that are facing wildlife on a major scale. So we're kind of pivoting and handling a lot of these different responses that aren't strictly oil spills as well. Gotcha. Wow. That must be really, um, I don't know, overwhelming and also gratifying to be a part of those types of um, global emergencies Definitely for birds. Um, so you had said your, your background, your undergraduate background, was it, did you say it was business? Is that? Yeah, it's or, international business and marketing. Okay. So how did you, like, how did you end up making that change into this, this field? Well, I'd been working in that industry for about like eight to 10 years. Um, and I just was not passionate about it. Mm. Um, it was something that I was good at, but that I just, you know, it just didn't connect with me. And I had spent, um, years just birding as a hobby and had enjoyed birds. And I finally just got to the point where I just wanted to do something that mattered and something that like I truly connected with and could feel passionate about. And so at one point I just quit my job and decided to give myself a little bit of time to explore and figure out what I wanted to do. And that's when I started volunteering at the, the bird rescue in San Pedro and found out like that, that was my thing. That was definitely where I wanted to, to focus on. So, um, just started exploring opportunities and luckily a job opened up there where I could uh, start to make an impact. Awesome. Um, what do you have any recommendations for anyone that might be listening to this who kind of wants to get their foot in the door with an organization like International Bird Rescue? Yeah, absolutely. I think volunteering is a great way to go um, because it lets you explore for yourself. Uh, for me, I had always I had always loved wildlife and thought that could be a cool thing to do, but I was too scared to really try it out. I was worried, um, like if I worked with wildlife, I'd wouldn't be able to handle kind of the realities of the situation that not all, not every bird makes it. I didn't know if I could handle the medical types of things, but by volunteering and actually getting to try out a few, you know, experience some of those things, I was able to realize like, oh, I can, I can handle this and I can actually be pretty good at it. Hmm. And so it was a great learning experience for me that way. Um, but it also provides opportunities to network and meet people, whether you end up um, working for the organization you volunteer for, or just learn about you know, it's kind of a small world with some of these areas, especially like rehab. So if you're at one rehab center, you're aware of all the other ones in the region and it's a great way to network and uh, find other opportunities. Cool. So you are um, graduating this May yeah. um, and that's, that's exciting. I mean, what, what's next for you? Like, do you feel, will, I don't know. You'll, you'll have a bit more time, I guess, um, <laughs> yeah. without your dragonfly coursework. Yeah, time, time will be helpful. Um, but what I'm excited about halfway through my program, um, I was offered a new position at bird rescue. Originally I'd been working in communications and social media. Um, but personally I had wanted to do more conservation work, things that like directly are impacting the birds. Um, and so as I worked through my schoolwork, this new opportunity opened up for me to work in the conservation and education uh, with Bird Rescue. So um, I'm hoping to really grow that role. It's a new department at Bird Rescue. And so it's an opportunity for me to really make, make whatever I can out of it. I want to help it grow and expand our influence and um, build partnerships. Um, I think that's a great skill that Project Dragonfly has built of like getting to know different people um, some of our projects, like I think specifically of the um, the community conservation workshop one, I can't remember the mm. the name of it. Cons conservation science and community. Yes, yep. yes that mm -hmm. one. Um, that one was a great exercise and just kind of reaching out to different people, kind of finding those intersections of our different um, 
our different goals, but, um, and just like working together for things. So that's something I really want to apply uh, moving forward in my, in my current role to just build those, build those partnerships and, in, and increase our impact um, by, by working together and, and, you know, sharing what we know and, you know, inspiring people to take action. So, yeah. Be well, working. nice. We'll definitely um, continue to be in touch with us. And, and even after graduation, I would say this to any graduates or alumni listening. Um, and we, I know there's a lot of folks that are excited about birds, rehab, general community connections. Um, so, so definitely use this network. Um, you know, obviously we're connected with so many zoos and botanical gardens, but all lots of other conservation organizations. And I also was thinking about our Belize partners um, with the yellow-headed parrot conservation work down there. I mean, pretty much each of the um, Earth expeditions as well has some sort of connection to not only birds, but different species of interest. Um, so yeah, anything before we wrap up, anything else you would like to share with, with folks? Well, I would encourage anyone... Um as they're working through their Project Dragonfly coursework and things, if they're interested in collaborating with Bird Rescue or uh, just working along with us, I'm happy to to work with anyone. It's been fun. I've actually had a few people reach out, not even knowing that I was in the pro program, but doing IAPs and things like that, that I've been able to collaborate with. So I'm always excited to work with folks. Um, it, I know it's a great program. And um, so feel free to reach out to me. It's education at birdrescue.org. Um, but yeah, and good luck. Awesome. Good luck to anyone who who joins in. It's been a wonderful <laughs> learning experience for me, and I'm sure it will be for others too. Yay, that's that's great. Thank you so much, Angie. And I'm sure it's inspiring to folks. Um, so thanks again for joining today on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you. Hi there, folks. Just one more thing before you head on out. If you have a moment. As I mentioned at the beginning, I would love to hear in what ways you are finding this podcast useful, how you listen, what you would like to hear more of, less of, etc. Please feel free to send me any and all feedback, any ideas for guests, etc. to Kevin Madison at my email, which is mattiskc at miamioh.edu. That's spelled M-A-T-T-E-S-K-C at miamioh.edu. Thanks again for listening. Have a great day.